Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us for Story Hour in the Library. Uh, we'd like to invite you back next month on May 5th for Story Hour in the Library, our student reading. So it's an opportunity for students on campus to showcase some of their own work. So we hope you do join us. And also during that daytime at noon is lunch poems as well with their student reading. Uh, we'd like to thank Zoe for coming and being part of Story Hour today. If you have a chance, we'd ask you to silence your cell phones or anything that might make noise. And if you have to get up during the reading, please do uh, quietly. And if you want to learn more about Story Hour, feel free to read, or sorry, feel free to visit storyhour.berkeley.edu. You can see all of our uh, podcasts as well as um, our future lineup for next season. And if you want to join our email list at the front desk, we have a sign-up sheet and you're welcome. And we just email you once a month letting you know what upcoming events. Um, I'd like to take a moment to also thank Dave Dewar because he's the director of development and one of the people who launched this program. He will be retiring at the end of of June, and so this might be one of his last story hours with us. So if we can give him a round of applause. Now I'd like to invite Vikram up for an introduction. Hi, uh, it's a great pleasure tonight to welcome Zoe Ferraris to Story Hour. She was born in Oklahoma and grew up in different countries around the world as her father, who was a colonel in the US Army, moved from base to base. When she was 19, she met her, first, uh, her future husband in San Francisco. He was a Saudi Palestinian who had come to the US to learn English. They married, had a daughter, and then went back to visit his family in Jeddah and ended up staying for nearly a year because, as Zoe puts it in an interview, it turns out you can't just visit for a week or two. You have to stay until his mother stops having heart episodes every time you get, go to the airport. <laughs> um, Zoe and her husband eventually parted ways, but she and her daughter have visited and maintained the connection with their Saudi family. In 2008, Zoe published her first novel, Finding Nuf, set in the port city of Jeddah. A, a, a desert guide named Nair Sharki is hired by a rich family to flee, find their missing 16-year-old daughter, Nuf. In order to solve the mystery of Nuf's disappearance, Nair needs to gain access to the world of women, which in his gender-segregated culture is all but impossible. So he teams up with Katya Hijari, Hijazi, a worker at the Jeddah coroner's office, an enterprising woman who is willing to risk the displeasure of her male superiors to aid him in his investigation. The reviewer for Entertainment Weekly wrote, what's remarkable about this debut is that its mystery takes place within a culture that is largely under wraps. The thriller plot is well placed, but it's the individual journeys of Nair and Katya who abide by society's strictures, even as they are frustrated by them, that elevate finding Nuf to a larger human drama. In 2010, Zoe published City of Veils, in which Katya, aided again by Nair, investigates the murder of Laila Navar, a, a rebellious young filmmaker. The investigation in, uh, soon involves American expatriates and leads into dangerous religious territory. Laila, it turns out, was making a subversive film about the origins of the Quran. Um, Joan Smith wrote in The Independent, at one level, this is a fascinating crime novel. Ferraris uses her experience to bring alive the country's culture and contradictions. But City of Wales does more than that, providing unique insights into the minds of men brought up to fear women and the desire they inspire. Claustrophobic and totally original, this is modern crime fiction at its very best. Zoe's latest book in this series, Kingdom of Strangers, was published in 2012. This time, Jeddah has a serial killer at work. Many of Katya's colleagues in the police believe that he must be a foreigner because serial killers are born only out of the decadence of the West. Her partner in this investigation, lead inspector Ibrahim Zahrani, has his own secrets to protect. As before, Zoe uses the form of the detective novel to move across and through the layers of a conservative culture, revealing the evasions and compromises that live just under the surface. Some of my favorite uh, moments in this book involve the intricacies of policing in such an environment. How do you investigate a female shoplifting ring whose members are all veiled as they commit their crimes? Can you catch a serial killer if the pictures of his women victims have been removed from old case files to preserve modesty? Um, the characters who deal with these quandaries are complex human beings brought fully alive with desire and dignity. 
Uh, I completely agree with the reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle who wrote, but it's the characters who drive this remarkable book, products of their foreign culture, but deeply familiar in their humanity. Here's hoping for another, another sequel. Um, I agree with that. I know Zoe's published a children's book since, and I won't bugger about it, but I want to read the sequel as well. Uh, please join me in welcoming Zoe Ferraris. Thank you. That was a really nice introduction. <clears throat> um, I, uh, I've been doing talking about this series for almost nine years and, and very, very familiar with it. As someone pointed out to me, who had, his brother met me at one of my first readings nine years ago. Um, but whenever I read in either a library or a university, I type notes because I'm like, just in case my teacher's there. I don't know. I'm a little nervous about it. Um, so I typed up some notes for myself, and as you were introducing me, I realized you just covered everything pretty much that I needed to cover. So thank you, actually, um, for saving me having to do that. Um, I, uh, I normally talk about my three books, and I understand at the end, in case there are questions, I'd be happy to answer those if anyone's you know, urgent with something. Um, but I think tonight I'm also going to do some reading, and that is a little unusual for me. Um, normally, my books are very heavy on the nonfiction, so people want to talk about that. You know, they don't, they want to save the book for themselves privately alone somewhere, and I completely respect that too. But I am going to read some short things, and I um, brought some other random things just in case. Um, so when I was 19, I married a, a Saudi man, and, and we fell madly in love, and I, you know, had a daughter, moved to Saudi Arabia, and, um, I went there, this was many years ago, it was before the internet, and I, I went there truly, um, in many ways, very ignorant of that culture. Uh, and without the resources to learn more, except through my ex-husband, I mean, we had National Geographic, we had Encyclopedia Britannica, you could order articles from you know, the encyclopedia, but we didn't have the sort of ease of information that you have today. So I went just very ignorant of um, what I was getting myself into. And um, <clears throat> my primary ignorance was just that, that common idea that women are totally oppressed by this culture. And I was going into that world, and I was going to be totally oppressed. And indeed, I lived in a very strictly conservative neighborhood in Jeddah. I lived inside an Arab family. I was not allowed to leave the house without my husband escorting me or my father-in-law. Um, I basically... <clears throat> The household itself was segregated, so I was not allowed into certain areas of the house if men were there, strange men. Um, I had to cover my face and my hands and you know my hair uh, pretty much all day if there were a, a, the possibility that a man could come into the house. It was, it was just sort of a, a restrictive, completely claustrophobic environment that I went into. Um, and yet, during the course of my almost the year that I spent there, I, I actually came away from that feeling a lot of empathy for the men who live in that situation as well as the women. And uh, I, I truly expected to come out of it just sort of hating like men in general. And the opposite occurred. I really felt, felt like this, this whole segregation of the genders has an effect on them. In, in a way that isn't often acknowledged. And I, I have actually gotten in trouble for saying this in public, like on Twitter. I blew up Twitter one time by saying this, and, and, and pretty much all females in Saudi Arabia were like, you're kidding, right? You feel sorry for the men in this culture? And a bunch of men just saying like, wow, you're my hero. <laughs> you know, awesome you. Um, but indeed, I experienced myself that a, a man in that culture who is a uh, good, normal person and uh, has a wife is going to have a wife who has been essentially infantilized by the culture, not allowed to drive, it's difficult to get around, it's difficult to get out, um, going to often encounter situations in society where you're not allowed to interact with people, you're not allowed to do things, regular things like go into certain stores, whatever. So, so the compensation for that lies with the man, the responsibility lies with the man. And, um, it can, it can become a huge burden. I mean, my ex-husband used to go to work 12, 13 hours and come home at the end of the day to a house full of women who'd been stuck inside all day and needed him to take them to the grocery store, to take the kids to the doctor, to go to whatever else that women do during the day. Um, 
and it, it drove him nuts. I mean, he used to just not come home. <laughs> After a while, he just sort of stayed away, kind of in this vague world. Um, this, to me, was uh, kind of the starting point for, for a lot of my writing about Saudi Arabia. I, I just, more than anything else, I wanted to represent the society more fairly, I guess, to give you a real window into what it's like, not just for the women, but for the men. And, um, but I came back from Saudi Arabia, and I spent the next 10 years, I, wasn't, I didn't consider myself a writer. I was just sort of, you know, I was studying math at Mills College. I, um, I talked to people. I did a lot of traveling in that time, and I talked to a lot of people, and everybody showed to me the same level of kind of ignorance of Saudi Arabia. And, and they were coming from the same place I was before I went there. They just didn't know that much about it. And, and even like, like people didn't understand the difference between Hinduism and Islam, you know, like that level of just knowing nothing. And for 10 years, I said to myself, you know, somebody should write a book about this country because there's nothing out there. There's really like not that much information, certainly nothing that puts you in that world and, and tries to force you to imagine it yourself. Um, and I guess after 10 years, I finally decided that since nobody else had done it, I'd better do it. Um, and I wrote, I wrote a book that was basically a thriller. And I was like, I had this American woman. She's living in Jeddah with her American husband. He goes missing, and she's sort of helpless and doesn't know how to find him again. Um, I sent the novel out to a ton of agents, and one out of maybe 40 people got back to me. And she said, I love this. This is fantastic. I could totally sell it. Um, but you need to take out all the Arabs. And I was just like, that is the most, I, I was absolutely out, I was pissed, I was like insulted, I was like, my Arab character that I'd created, who, an Arab man who helped this woman, he was, he was wonderful, he was my favorite character, and I was so angry about it, I actually scrapped the novel and started from scratch and decided that that guy was gonna be my main character and what I had set out to do was write about Saudi Arabia and write about Arabs, and so I was just gonna go ahead and do that. Um, it took many years to write the novel and find an agent for it and get it onto publisher's desks, but when it did, it got rejected like probably 35 times before someone bought it. And many of the rejections said the same thing. They said, the um, publishers or editors said that, you know, this is going to be a really hard sell in this culture because Americans in general don't want to read about other places, you know, and they don't like it when the main characters are not familiar to them. And, um, you know, basically it was too exotic, is what they were saying. Um, and, and I mean, that's crap, and I got really angry about that too, and I would have probably been like, fine, I'll publish it myself if it was today. But um, we did find one person who was willing to take a risk on it. Um, and I am very pleased to say that the book is still in print. My first novel, Finding Nov, came out in 2008. Um, I'm still earning a living from these novels. Um, they've been published in over 40 countries. They've been translated into 35 languages. So I'm so happy to tell publishers that they were wrong. <laughs> there are people who want to read about this stuff. Um, on a side note, publishing today is uh, kind of in a min sort of mini crisis about diversity in publishing. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up reading stuff that was, I loved stuff that was set in a foreign country that seemed like almost a requirement for me. I remember just being completely in love with Isabella Allende and Amy Tan and, and just a ton of writers that, you know, were freely going to take you all over the world. And, um, and yet today, it seems like every month there's a panel in New York publishing about diversity and we don't have enough diversity in fiction. And indeed, that, that's actually true, I think. I would agree with that. Um, but I, I think that publishers look at a book and they say, money, how much money can I make off of this? And, and that's a risk-averse behavior. And so I'm glad that there are still people out there who take risks, and I hope that that continues. Um, my books are heavy on the nonfiction. I, uh, I'm representing a culture that most people don't know much about or probably will never go to. And, um, and that's a sort of tricky thing. There's a great phrase that I often think of. Um, in, in English, fairy tales begin with uh, once upon a time. And in Arabic, they begin with kanya makan, which means there was and there was not. And, and I, I think that's the perfect description of books like these, where you are basically, it, it's true. The world I'm telling you about is a real world, but the characters are obviously fictional. And the things, the setting, everything that I've created around it is, is from my imagination. Um, 
But I, I have my main character, Nair, who is very, very real to me, very based on a composite of people that I knew when I was there. Um, he is a devout Muslim man who is trying very hard to follow the prescriptions of his society. And that's very hard for him to do because uh, what he wants more than anything in the world is to get married and have a family. He's an orphan. He was raised by a bachelor uncle, and he lacks the extended family network to arrange a marriage for him. So he's constantly urging, he has an urge to have a wife and kids, but he's just not allowed to talk to women in public. Um, I didn't set out to write a mystery per se. I just, I needed some way to get him to... Uh, out of his shell. And the only thing I could think of realistically to do that was murder. I was like, you know, this guy needs a higher moral imperative, something that's more important to him than, than his religiosity. And, um, and to me, murder was the thing, you know, that had to happen. His best friend's sister goes missing in Finding Nov. Um, and she shows up dead in the desert, and he is the only one who realizes that it probably was not an accident. Uh, he sees her body, sees certain things about the death, and he is a desert guide himself. So he um, basically takes it upon himself to investigate her murder. He alone realizes that uh, that something foul is, um, is, is going on here. And um, essentially, the only way to investigate the murder of a woman is to talk to the women who knew her. And because she's a woman, mostly the people in her lives were women. And he needs Katya to do that. And so Katya is very independent, very free thinking. She really doesn't like Nair very much. He's sort of old fashioned and uh, his attitude toward her is a little bit insulting. Um, but the three books track the course of their relationship. And um, I don't wanna give away any spoilers, but it doesn't turn out that badly in the end. Um, however, I am going to read a section from Finding Nove, and I, it, this is one of those scenes in this book that is based on a, an actual event. My ex-husband, one day in Saudi Arabia, was extremely bored, and he decided that he wanted to go shopping, and so he took me to this jacket bazaar. It was basically a huge outdoor market filled with outerwear, and um, he decided he wanted to buy a Colombo coat because Colombo was his favorite television personality, and uh, he was going to put on the coat and set off to solve some mysteries. And I, I was like, you know, okay, we'll do that. Um, but while we were there, I thought, you know, I loved mysteries growing up. I loved all kinds of cat mysteries, anything, you know, I just love mysteries and we've never seen an Arab investigator. And uh, so later when I was writing the book, that, that kind of came back to me, that moment. So I'm going to read a short section from Finding Nof where that scene from real life made its way into my fiction. Nair and his friend Othman, who is sister Nov, has just died, are at this bazaar. The prayers finished, Othman mentioned, mo motioned him into the bazaar. They slid beneath a string of tasseled lights and found themselves in the fluorescent glow of a children's toy boutique the only one on the lot, which sold Star Wars beach towels and G.I. Joe balloons and plastic Barbie umbrellas by the case. Cutting to the left, they passed a row of vendors hawking pirate cassettes of Um Kothum. Nair stared distractedly at his surroundings as they headed into the jacket quarter. Dozens of jacket stalls spread out before them. Uthman started to laugh. I'll never get over a sight like this, he said. Nair had to admit, buying outerwear in the world's hottest climate was a little weird. The vendors didn't seem to realize the futility of their profession because they embraced it with a passion rivaled only by that of the fireplace and central heating vendors in the separate market on the other side of town. The coat vendors kept their racks lined with sable, mink, rabbit, and fox. Trench coats were always in fashion, as were faux Dalmatian swing coats, gray and black pea coats lined with fiberglass stiffeners, and woolen suit coats in sizes that ranged from tiny to utterly grotesque. Each vendor had a flat stall that faced the pedestrian traffic the jackets in a neat row with, like a herd of elephants, their noses hanging over the street. Of the many vendors, Nair had come to know the Katani brothers. He preferred their stalls. They had the biggest selection. They never complained when he tried things on, and he didn't, they didn't seem to mind that he never actually purchased their goods, just wandered through the racks every few months in search of an intangible something. 
Just as they approached the Katani stall, an entourage of bachelors, rich Saudi men in spanking white robes, descended on the ladies' section. They spread out like soldiers occupying space, their manicured hands deftly fingering the goods. Nair watched them with disgust and wondered if they were buying coats for their fiancés, too. Seeing Othman move into the crowd of bachelors made him uneasy. He looked and acted just like them. They were all hypocrites, because every man knew that the anticipation of travel, the hallmark of any marriage proposal, was in fact its greatest delusion. None of these buffoons had any intention of taking his new wife anywhere, at least not if he could help it. Nair moved in his own direction. He browsed through the coats and tried to imagine which of the many would fit his own future wife. The Russian fur, too showy. The bomber jacket with the American insignia. In what fantasy world would he ever take a woman to America? No, he would never buy a woman a coat. If she did own a coat, it would have to be one that she purchased herself. Badu! Issa came around the cash register to greet him. His brother, Shaban, seated on a folding chair behind the counter, poked his head up and smiled. Nice to see you, Issa said. It's been a long time. Tell me, you're not here because it's wedding season, are you? No, Nair gave a dry laugh. No, thank you. He went back to browling the racks, pausing at the raincoats, admiring the colors until he came to the trench coats. One in particular caught his eye, beige, lightweight, a classic cut. Issa noticed and laid a hand on his belly. Look, Shaban, the Colombo coat. Is that what he wants? What did you call it, Nair asked. You know, Peter Falk. Issa cocked an air gun. Bang, bang, private eye. He did some fancy shooting while Nair slid into the coat. Issa gasped. Yes, it's you. 100% man. This last was in English, which made them all laugh. Nair went to the cash register and stood in front of the mirror. The coat fit perfectly. He stuck his hand in the pocket, which was lined with satin and a few grains of sand that would be forever jammed in the bottom corner. He buttoned it, unbuttoned it, flipped up the collar, and ran his hands down the front to smooth out the wrinkles. Othman came over, a grin on his face. Buying something, he asked. Nair turned away from the mirror. I didn't really come here to buy a coat. Issa grew stern. That's fine. I know you're a modest man, but I'll give you the right price. Nair hedged. It was ridiculous to buy a coat. What was it? A showy garment. And wasn't one of the greatest sins wearing garments with pride? He couldn't wear it in the desert. He couldn't wear it in the city. And wasn't it a raincoat, after all? In Jeddah, it rained once a year for approximately five minutes, if they were lucky. But he liked it. He wanted it. Besides, the Quran said that garments were bestowed upon man to cover his shame, but also to adorn him. There was no sin in self-adornment. O oh, children of Adam, wear your beautiful apparel at every time and place. Othman came up beside him. It is a modest coat. I think it fits you. Tentatively, Nair turned back to the mirror. Othman was right. It was a simple coat. Thanks. Um, so... Saudi Arabia has kind of kept my interest for 25 years because it's never been black and white to me. I mean, the, the media tells us that it is literally black and white. Women wear black, men wear white. But uh, Jeddah is, is just the most insane city full of contradictions all the time. Um, I mean, music is forbidden, but uh, they have outdoor concerts, you know, and which stop for prayer time. Um, it's, it's the sort of, just got this incredible energy about it. It's one of the most di diverse cities in the world. It's a gateway to Mecca. People come there from all over the world and often stay. Um, so I've, I've struggled in my books to really capture that complexity and to strip away the notions of black and white and to strip away the notions of women being weak and vulnerable and men being strong and, and aggressive. Um, and I, I, what I, the last thing I brought to read tonight is actually uh, a short section from a memoir that I started a long time ago and gave up on. Um, the reason I gave up on it is because it was, it was very personal to a lot of the women that I knew in Saudi Arabia, and they were uh, just the kind of people who would be really offended if that ever made it to print. So um, I didn't want to necessarily like disperse it into the great wide world, but... Um, I do occasionally break out sections of it. And so this particular section is uh, it's about my ex-husband. And uh, the reason I like it and the reason I read it is, is it's, it's really captures his zaniness, but it also 
kind of breaks down a lot of those stereotypes we have about Arab men. I think the number one being that they're all terrorists, so they're all like somehow, you know, like angry and manic. Um, and uh, my ex-husband, Assam, I had lived in America when I met him. He'd been here for 10 years. He was extremely uh, Americanized, I guess you could say. He didn't pray anymore. He, you know, was pr pretty much a California boy by that point. <laughs> um, the title of this short piece is called Encounters with Languish. Uh, my ex-husband, Assam, left Saudi Arabia to escape a particularly abominable arranged marriage. When he left, he told his parents he was going to San Francisco to improve his English. Seven years later, when I met him at his gas station, he was still improving his English. Assam loved California, but living in America had done little to change his habits. He still wore a white robe, still ate dinner on a floor mat, and still smoked hookah after every meal. And despite his immersion in a monolinguistic society, he still spoke his very own brand of English. He liked to call it languish. He accomplished his sentences with a kind of verbal carpentry, gripping a verb and a vice, hammering it with a few nouns, and sanding down the participles. He wasn't fond of pronouns, and prepositions failed him altogether. But when I pointed this out, he got mad to me because I hurt to his feelings. As I got to know him, I realized that correcting his errors was missing the point. His speech had a quality of humorous misfortune that he liked to call azar, which was, he said, where we get the word hazard. I wasn't sure I believed him, but apparently other English words had been Arabic once, like alcove, alchemy, alcohol, and al Capone. <laughs> he didn't have a sloppy listening habit or an apathy for communication. For a child born into this culture, English, learning English is as natural as breathing. But for Assam, it was bafflingly complex, expanding light years beyond the simple vocabulary taught at his late night ESL classes. The real language was gluttonous, overburdened with phrases from every culture on earth, porked up with remote pop culture references, cliche, proverb, slang, euphemism, and a great nuisance of archaic spelling and grammar, all of it mutating at the speed of sound. It was impossible to keep up with. And that suited Assam just fine in his ongoing drive to learn language as slowly as possible. When we moved in together, I thought I might try learning Arabic. The US Department of Defense classified Arabic as a level four language. Level one is the easiest, and the only other level four language was Mandarin Chinese. But for some reason, I thought I might try to learn it on my own. I sat for hours listening to military language tapes, learning to say things like, take me to your leader, and where is the mess tent? listening to men talk in the living room and to phone conversations between Assam and his family in Saudi Arabia, never understanding a single word. They say that babies, when they begin to babble, are actually babbling every sound on earth, and over the course of time, their range narrows to the sounds of their language. So, like a baby, I began to recognize sounds, Assam acting the patient mother, repeating important words again and again, hubby, my lover, hayati, my life, atini shai, bring me tea, but if I was an infant with Arabic, then Assam regarding English had occupied that phase of childhood where a partial understanding of things conjured a world of fairy tales and odd grotesquerie. The phase peaked for me in kindergarten when I first recited the Pledge of Allegiance and to the Republic for which it stands. What, I wondered, is a which it stand? In my mind, I saw it clearly. It was a small wooden shack by the side of the road where an old gray-haired woman sold Halloween hats, candy corn, and broomsticks. During the course of our marriage, Assam embraced the witched stand phase. We moved into a crummy, dilapidated, rat-infested cottage that gave us a spectacular view of the sea, a real estate phenomenon he referred to as the cream of the crap. <laughs> With horror, he told me that our neighbor was a devoted charcoal eater. Women, she told him, love to eat charcoal. Personally, I eat it every day, but I still keep it hidden from the kids. I don't want them ruining their teeth. In Assam's mind, a Charlie horse was somehow confused with an image from the Godfather so that he imagined a midnight muscle cramp was a disembodied horse's head named Charlie chewing on his leg. On some nights, he said, it was not safe to go to the mattresses. Jack Tripper, the geeky roommate of Three's Company fame, was actually a Victorian serial killer who spent a lot of time in an opium den. And it was from Assam that I first heard about Soviet President Burger Chef, who opened the Eastern Bloc to McDonald's, and who really ought to have been called Burger King. In Saudi fashion, the world was divided into two distinct genders, male and female. Body parts were equally dangerous territory. My wrist was a risk. Penis was such an ugly sound that despite being a good Muslim, he preferred the term salami. 
Labia was the opposite of conservative. Real labia were fondly referred to as fenders, and every woman's menstrual cycle was preceded by a bad case of UPS, the monthly package. <laughs> his spelling was tireless. Assam Asned spelled his name any way he pleased. And after he discovered that his name had a literal translation, he began to sign his checks as Sammy Flintstone. It was a federal agent's wet dream. He had so many names, he had to be a criminal. On his driver's license application, he followed the conventions of written Arabic and spelled him, his name without vowels, Mr. S-M-Z-N-D. When the records clerk jerked a finger in his face, no funny business, Mr. Assam looked at her and said, I thought this was the DMV. The only time I ever saw him get agitated was watching Star Trek The Next Generation. The plot rolled along with dialogue that was easy enough to understand until, Captain, we've encountered a non-dispersing wavefront of subspace distortion. Assam would leap up from the recliner and roar, What? What did he say? Explain that to me. But even for a native, it was completely indecipherable, and of course I couldn't explain during subspace distortion. When years later we moved to Saudi Arabia and learning Arabic became, in fact, a requirement for my survival, I suddenly learned it faster than I'd ever learned English, but I still never reached the point of being able to make a joke. Yet even in the childhood of his English, Assam was my Shakespeare, body, master of the malaprop, riffing the modern tongue with enough creative gusto to dizzy the persnickety grammar critics, and there were always those, Jesus, buddy, habla espanol, when in Rome you should learn to speak English. But he did speak English. He delighted in it. It was a shapeshifter, a fairy godmother, and a magic wand. To this day, I search for that kind of inspiration and strive to speak English half as well as he did. All right, I see that it's 5.45, and I'm happy to answer questions about Saudi Arabia, about the writing process, if anyone has any. Yeah, go ahead. I have not seen the movie, no. It's the only movie made in Saudi Arabia, so she said all the movies made in Saudi Arabia, 100% of them made in Saudi Arabia, right? It's a very, very, very good movie about a ten-year-old girl. It's a bicycle. Oh, the bicycle movie, yes, I've heard of this, okay. Yeah. Since that year, and Katya get hitched. <laughs> Spoiler alert. That's fine. <laughs> um, no, not necessarily. So he's asking about if there was going to be a, a fourth book in the series. Um, I started writing one, and then I kind of came to a halt with it. It didn't feel like it was ready or right. And I, I'm trying to respect the writing process over the need for financial gain. <laughs> um, I feel like it'll happen when it's ready. Thank you, though. Yeah. I have read parts of it, but I've never, I believe there's a book out there, but I've never, no. Very different, but you know, I, I for City of Vales, my second book, I did a lot of research into the desert. Um, and I came across a lot of the older stuff, you know, and actually it was during that time, about 100 years ago, when the explorations of the empty quarter were really interesting and sort of first being recorded by um, Westerners, I guess. Did break the boundary between the British and the period of their own lives, their own lives, their own lives, their Yeah, yeah, Rebecca West. Yeah. Yeah. Katya is is also an outsider. Nair's more of an outsider. He he was definitely inspired by the the men. Uh, my ex husband's good friends, basically, who it took me a very long time to get to know because they were devout and I was a woman, but they. They were, most of them immigrants, the children of immigrants who'd been born and raised in Saudi. So they considered themselves Saudis, but they didn't have those extended family networks um, to, you know, find arranged marriages 
out of um, my ex-husband's siblings, all of them married first cousins. So that was kind of the norm, and I think still is, to marry within the family like that. Um, so there was um, the choice to make him an outsider was partly just to emphasize that, just to make him really unable, because you know, a lot of Saudi men they don't want to do an arranged marriage, but they'll so they'll try to talk to women, and they have the same kind of issues that Nair has, but just to make it really plain for an American reader, like this guy's really on the outside, you know, and like that's just as hard as possible for the poor guy. I don't know, you know, but he was definitely based on people. Uh, one other yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, it's really going to, I think, in a large part depend on the leadership and kind of where that goes. Um, I don't know if I have a particular take. I, I kind of always feel like I'm in suspense with it because, I mean, it's changed so much. The country really has changed in 25 years, but it's also remained firmly the same, aggressively the same. And I see a lot of extremism in not just in terrorist acts, but in daily life and sort of raising its head and becoming normalized somehow. So uh, just this week, actually, the Saudi government took away the religious police, took away their right to arrest and detain people. It's just become so, uh, they've become so aggressive, you know, that, that, that moralizing virtue police thing, uh, that the government finally had to step in and say, you're not allowed, if you're gonna arrest somebody, you gotta take them to an authentic police office. And like that never had to happen before, you know? So there's, there's some pretty dangerous, things going on in that society, but so is that, it's also going on in our society, you know? And it, it I think it's it's like almost like a, a worldwide phenomenon right now. A very bad one. A bad one, indeed, yes. <laughs> yeah. When you were talking about the feeling you came to develop with men, how they were attracted to the system too, it seems like you're describing a system that's onerous to both man and woman. Um, well, I do know there are a lot of theories, okay? Um, my, the, my sort of go-to explanation in turn inside me is that uh, it's connected to Bedouin culture very strongly. And uh, there was a very traditional separation of the genders in Bedouin culture, and there still is. And that has a, a lot of things about the Bedouin culture have sort of like filtered into what is today mainstream Saudi culture, in, and that's one of them. Um, but I don't, you know, I, you know, sort of philosophically looking at, at the issue, I, I don't know that there's, there's like one answer to that, you know, why this happened or why this came out of, you know, what it came out of. Um, I do, I, I just think, you know, it, it, there's a kind of honor of, I mean, if you talk to your average person today in Saudi Arabia and say, why do you think this is okay? Why is it that you want to, to see women over here and men over here in a restaurant, for example, or a wedding even? Ridiculous, right? You're getting married. Um, why is that okay? And they'll say, well, this is the way it's always been done. So it's this, this honor of tradition. And when you, add, when you push that and you go, what is that tradition? What exactly? Where does that come from? They'll say the Bedouin. They'll, they'll, they'll lean back to that. And, and we, we kind of have something similar here, actually, where... Uh, not, it's not too great in a culture, but we have this kind of romantic mentality about the ancestors, you know, about it's not our ancestors, it's more like the Native Americans. There's something sort of mystical and spiritual attached to that whole thing, and people think that same way about the Bedouin, and I think that that allows them to give a kind of credence to, um, to gender segregation, you know, because that's how it was practiced back then, and that's their image of it. So... I will also say, though, that uh, there is tons of argument against it, you know, and there are plenty of instances where, I mean, women speak out against it a lot, especially today, um, and you also see just like I personally have experienced every single Arab I, I, I talk to who I tell them, oh, yeah, I wrote a book about Saudi Arabia. If they're not from Saudi Arabia, I think 
like 99% of them will be like, Ugh, that country, you know, and they'll go off on a rant because they're just so annoyed. They're just like that. They give Islam a bad name. They're so extreme. They're, you know, everybody in America thinks they represent Islam and they're, they're just so on the fringe. And, and I, and I think that that is true, you know, in general for Islam. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think you can say that it's an Islamic thing. In other words, you know, the segregation. So there are, it, the Quran is a little bit like the Bible in this way. You can find a quote for whatever you need. You know, like if you want to say, yeah, women should be over here, men over there. You've got your quote for that, but you've also got your quotes for, you know, men and women living fine together. And yeah. Thank you. Your mention of the rich young bachelor reminded me of something I've always wondered about. Well, in India, when you see a woman wearing a burqa, you also notice this way she cuts status, right? So under the burqa, there might be Prada, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the same way. I just, I, the thing that actually used to surprise me is you would walk into a man's clothing store and like it's literally every single thing is the same. It's all the same white robe, but it's like the Yves Saint Laurent version or the, you know, like all the designer versions. Oh, there are designers. There are designers and they do robes and <laughs> it's like, okay. Um, you can tell, I mean, it's, it's all very subtle. Obviously, it's like the maybe the watch or the ring that you're wearing or, you know, you start to notice it when you're in that environment. You just go, oh, the shoes. It's like the only thing you're showing is shoes. You've got your socks and your gloves and your face is totally covered, but you got your shoes. So there's a lot of stuff like that, men too. Um, the one thing I do like to say about like the whole covering in general is that it's that is really... I think traditionally the ideal behind that is humility is like if everybody's the same and you're just all covered in this really you know this tent like way you're de-emphasizing the material world in such a way that um, you're allowing you're you're allowing a statement to be made that you're focusing on the internal world the spiritual world the the things that are not you know temptations and whatnot and uh, there's something kind of beautiful about that and I know certainly when I lived in Saudi Arabia I I, I many times was grateful to just be able to hide behind some big robe and not have people stare at my face and not have, and, uh, and even though I came back here with some issues regarding exposure of skin, I also came back with like, like I appreciate that about this culture and I like kind of, you know, being able to, wish we had that here, not having to have, you know, be on or be good looking at all times or whatever, you know, always having people stare. So yeah, go ahead. Um, I found the books on, I, I read all three of them, and I thought they were great. Thanks. I found them as a woman, I found them sort of painful to read because of all of the multitude of restrictions on the women. And one thing that struck me is the women covering up the main character. Um, he doesn't even want to look at a woman's eyes. And it almost becomes, the women become hypersexualized is the impression I got. And I don't know if that's a correct impression. Yeah, um, I think I, I have that. That is definitely, I've, this is an argument, you know. Uh, one of the kind of big feminist arguments about Saudi Arabia from Arab feminists is like, you know, don't sexualize women. And just by not looking at them, by not talking to them, by, um, you know, trying to push them over here, that's basically what you're doing. So, yeah, I think that's true. And I, I definitely, um, I think that... Uh, there is a lot that needs to be done to correct that, you know, just on a sort of safety issue way, you know. Um, but at the same time, I never, I, I felt very safe when I lived there, you know. And uh, I don't know, maybe it was a different time. I don't know, I still feel safe when I go back, you know. It's not... It, I feel like, you know, you can walk down, you clear a path <laughs> as a woman walking down the street. Men literally do turn away from you. They literally, there is a kind of like force field around you or something that allows you to, um, but you're right. There is the same thing where you're, you know, you're objectified. There's an ob objectification going on. Yeah. So you didn't mention, do you, did you have a, a son or a daughter? 
Oh, I have a daughter. And so how did that work, taking a daughter and raising her, or thinking about raising her in that kind of society? Did you have any qualms about that? Yeah, I did at the time. I mean, so when I came back here, my husband came with me, and we divorced a year later because he wanted to go back. He really wanted to live there, and I was just like, nah, you know, <laughs> not really. Um, and having a, having a daughter was another concern. I was like, you know, and I have a daughter who would be raised there, and that seemed not comfortable to me, you know. So how do you it's you changed a lot. With your daughter? How, and she sees this extraordinary difference. How do you talk to her about that? She's just like, oh my God, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> she really, yeah. Um, Seriously, but a lot has changed. So her, my sister's-in-law, when I first went there, it was like 20, right, right after the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, um, my sister's-in-law all wanted to go to college. They all wanted to like have careers before they had kids. It was kind of like, yeah, just like American women, but they never, they, they were married at 16. They started having babies. By the time they were in their 30s, they had nine kids each. Like it was very traditional, arranged marriages, everything. Almost all of their daughters are in college right now and pursuing careers and making their own decisions about when they're going to get married and if they're going to get married. And so a lot has changed. And I, I credit just general changes in society, but I also credit the internet with a lot of that, you know, and just the access to information and the kind of ability of like, you know, Nair is a product of 2008. Like today, a younger Nair would probably try at least to meet a woman on Twitter or something, you know, there's plenty of apps where you could like maybe start talking to people and it's a little bit different, you know, there's still the same taboo around it. There's still the same, you know, restrictions going on, but um, yeah, the options are different now. They, uh, they're trying. I mean, the, the country is trying. In fact, I think it was like three years ago they decided they were going to build a whole new city just so that like they would have a place where women could go to work. <laughs> just like, it was like, let's just like reset, hit a hard reset on this country. Literally, we're going to build a new city and women will be allowed to work in that city. And it's like, you know, there are places where obviously women are allowed to work where they need women, you know, like in certain hospitals or in schools, women's girls schools, all that stuff. Like, but it's very segregated. It's very, um, you know, they have free education for women. You could go to university and get an awesome degree and come out and like literally there's no job for you. So, and that's a big, that's kind of the new kind of place where culture is really pushing forward. It's like trying to get women to work. My second novel, City of Veils, uh, one of the things that I go into is the lingerie industry, which traditionally is run and operated by men, you know, which is like completely bizarre, right? You're in this country where you're not allowed to talk to women, but they need to buy underwear and bras from you. It's a little awkward. And um, so there, there's been a sort of an ongoing fight in the, in the government even to like, they finally made a law that women were allowed to work in lingerie stores. <laughs> it's like, good for you. Shoot, man. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like if there's any last question, I'm happy to answer it, but it's 6 o'clock. I want to let you go. Thank you so much for joining me.